Hello, BookTube. I was watching a video from Vin at Revenant Reads uh, earlier today where he shows uh, book haul proceeds from his visit to his local Goodwills, which is a, a quasi-regional charity shop chain here in the Northeast, uh, the, the equivalent of Savers in, in uh, the Middle States, or uh, I almost said the Middle Colonies, <laughs> reading too much Colonial America. Uh, there are, there are versions, variations of this, although I think Goodwill is a national chain. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating, the finds that he found. Uh, I'm, I was extra interested, of course, because Vin is our dauntless, read, our dauntless leader for Book Trek 2021, our epic Star Trek reading event. Uh, is in a little bit of abeyance on this channel, although it will be coming back. Uh, so I watched that video, and I, I sent him an email and said that, that was fascinating. Uh, I have a couple of Goodwills within striking distance of me that I never go to. I just assume that their book section will be terrible. Uh, you, your, your urge to go to places like the Goodwill is significantly lessened if you have something like the Brattle Bookshop, which I do. So uh, I sent him a message and said, you know, I have, I have a couple of Goodwills within striking distance of me that I haven't gone in a long time. And he sent a message back. Uh, it was full of profanities, both in English and in Klingon saying that I should go to my local Goodwills and get a lot of books and do a book haul, and that if I don't do that, I may, as he put it, wicked piss a loser. <laughs> uh, so I did. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want Finn spreading rumors about me on social media. I don't want him doing an invidious TikTok dance routine against me. <laughs> so I went to the two Goodwills that are within striking distance of me, just because it had been a while, uh, just to see what it would be like. Uh, and it was a deeply unpleasant experience. I don't know if I caught these Goodwills on bad days, but I got really, really rude help from the staff and really, really rude behavior from the people in the Goodwill elbowing me aside, standing uh, athwart a narrow aisle and not moving when I say excuse me, all that kind of stuff. And also uh, a, a group of ladies who were sorting through blankets and pillows and uh, taking up God's own amount of space to do it, who seemed genuinely mystified when I told them that I wanted to look at the books. They seemed genuinely mystified that anybody would want to look at books. <laughs> it, it wasn't. It wasn't just we don't feel like moving or we're really rude. It was wow, what you want to look at books? Uh, so the experience wasn't all that pleasant. But I, I don't know if your goodwills are like this, but these goodwills had roving sales, just all over the place, different sales in different stores. So I, the, I got a stack of books for a song for almost no money at all. Maybe that's why goodwills are so popular. Uh, the only time I usually go to Goodwills is when I have access to a car. When someone is driving me and we go by a Goodwill, you can count on me setting up a supersonic scream until I get my way, kicking at the back seat. <laughs> and one of the things I love about, have loved about Goodwills over the years when I go with a car is that you can get a good bookcase a lot of the times. A uh, thing that will cost you $35 at Goodwill will cost you $350 if you buy it online. Uh, and also clothes. I, I know this will shock you, but I have very little when it, I have very little vanity when it comes to my personal appearance, and I have no trouble at all with buying what a, what a dear old friend of mine once referred to as dead people's clothes. I have no problem with that at all. Get go to Goodwill if I have a car if it's nice and convenient. Go to a Goodwill, get a bunch of T-shirts or polo shirts or even a pair of pants or two or a sweatshirt pay $20 for a bag load of clothes, each one of which would be $30 if they were bought new. Oh, it's Beans Yoga. Your yoga. They love it when you do yoga. So do I. So do I. <laughs> uh, I forget where I was because the bean is being so cute. <laughs> You're being so cute. You're distracting me. Oh, aren't you adorable? Oh. Oh. She really wants to go on long walks these days, but it's so hot, we have to temper it. We'll go at sunset. Uh, what was that? Oh, God, no, why do you keep doing yoga? You just keep stealing the show. Uh, where was I? Oh, right, the Goodwill. <laughs> the Goodwill. See, Vin's videos are over in 15 minutes, max. 
<laughs> I haven't finished throat clearing and anecdote telling in 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, buying clothes at Goodwill, I absolutely love. Absolutely love to do it. it. Takes a little bit of time. A little bit. You have to. I go item by item. I want to make sure that it's that it's a, a good manufacturer. You know, I look for type for labels that I would never buy new, like Champion or Lands End, something where I know the things are going to be put together well, so that even though I'm getting it secondhand, it's still going to last a long time. And I look for sizes. Uh, to get the right size, so to get double or triple extra large, because things tend to turn into handkerchiefs when I put them in the dryer. I know that probably means I'm drying them wrong, but I'm not about to change my ways, so I need very large clothes. Uh, I love doing that, but this time around, this time around I got no clothes, and I got a pile of books, so I thought we'd go through them together now that we finally got to the books. Uh, the first batch are mass market paperbacks, including this first one, uh, this this Penguin Books uh, crime classic. I love the look of these things. Just love the look of them. These these green and white cl crime classics. This is Edmund Crispin, uh, who took that's a pen name, and he took his pen name from a character in another mystery novel, one that we've seen on this channel by Hammond Inns. Uh, and his protagonist, his his sleuth, is an Oxford don, uh, which is a that kind of amateur detective solving, I really have very little patience for. But I will I give Dorothy Sayers a pass, absolutely. And I give Edmund Crispin a pass because his books are so, so good. They're just so... He's so present as a writer. He's right there with you. Uh, as a, I, I could give you an example. Uh, this, this novel starts off with a famous poet, Richard Cadogan, uh, practicing his his revolver in his back garden <laughs> uh, and missing his target. And with him in the back garden is his publisher uh, uh, who's offering him terms for his new collection of poetry. The terms are uh, Mr. Spode is offering him terms of uh, where is it here? 5% on the first thousand, seven and a half on the second thousand, and we shan't sell more than that, and no advance. So you get a percentage of the sales for the first 1,000 copies of the book, but we're not giving you any money up front. And uh, Cadogan wants money up front. He wants 50 pounds up front, uh, and keeps saying it. He keeps telling that to, uh, to Spode. He says, uh, Spode says, why have you developed this mania for pistols? And Cadogan says, Cadogan straightened up with a faint sigh. He felt every month of his 37 years. Look, he said, it will be better for if we both talk about the same subject at the same time. This isn't a checkoff play. Besides, you're being evasive. I asked for an advance on the book. Fifty pounds. Uh, Spode here mentions his partners, uh, Nutling and Orlick. He starts to invoke them as a reason why he can't possibly agree to a fifty-pound advance. And uh, Cadogan says, Both Nutling and Orlick are quite legendary and fabulous. They're scapegoats you've invented to take the blame for your own meanness and philistinism. Here I am, by common consent, one of the three most eminent of living poets, with three books written about me, all terrible, but never mind that, lengthily eulogized in all accounts of 20th century literature. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Spode held up his hand like one trying to stop a bus. Of course, you're very well known indeed. Yes, he coughed nervously. But uh, unhappily, that doesn't mean that many people buy your books. The public is quite uncultured, and the firm isn't so rich that we can afford... And uh, Cadogan interrupts him. I'm going on a holiday, and I need money. Uh, yes, of course, but surely some more dance lyrics? <laughs> Which is the thing that, when Cadogan writes them, really make the publisher money. Uh, let me inform you, my dear Irwin, that I've been held up for two months over a dance lyric because I can't think of a rhyme for British. Skittish, suggested Mr. Spode feebly. Cadogan gazed at him contemptuously. Besides which, he pursued, I am sick and tired of earning my living from dance lyrics. I may have an aged publisher to support, but there are limits. And I love the invent the playfulness, just in that one excerpt that runs throughout all of these books, because Spode says skittish as a rhyme for British, and the next thing Cadogan says is also a rhyme for British, besides which. That is just beautiful. That's when you know that the author is standing there right with you, that he's having a ball writing this book. Uh, and that, that's, that's fantastic. I don't know how much Edmund Crispin I have in ebook form. 
but I have a couple of them in these in these uh, Penguin cli Crime classics. So I'm glad to find this one. Uh, then these the next uh, next one is uh, Mass Market Paperback. You're all going to recognize. You've almost all studied it in school. Uh, it's Burton Raffles' translation of Beowulf. Classic old mentor paperback made them a mint of money. Made Burton Raffle a mint of money. Uh, forever and ever, this was the only Beowulf edition that you would get assigned in school. High schools, colleges, graduate schools, all across the country, all across the Western, the English-speaking world, for all I know. Millions and millions of copies of this thing. So it was a, a success. It was a real success. There were... Uh, quibbling voices right from the beginning that it wasn't so much of a success as a translation of Beowulf. I would actually kind of agree with that. I know every line of this thing because I know it backwards and forwards. I, this was the translation in English that I was dealing with forever and ever and ever. Uh, but I do agree that a lot of the really distinctive qualities of this poem, Raffle just gets rid of in order to make a kind of a standard blank verse English poem out of this thing. Uh, he sands down a lot of the strangeness. Uh, I think he does a remarkable job. I think the thing he produces is every bit as remarkable. Uh, and I realized as soon as I saw it that I don't have a copy. This is in fine condition. Frida. Frida, what are you doing? What are you doing, baby? I hear you doing something. Come here. Come up here and sit in front of your fan. Come here. Come on. Come up here. Oh, baby, don't stare at me like that. Come here. Come up here. I don't want you futzing around when I can't see you. Come here. Come up here. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, no, baby, go all the way up on your... Uh, go all the way up on your seat. Oh, baby girl. Oh. <laughs> all right. She just wants to be there. <laughs> she doesn't actually want to go back up on her seat. Uh, so we'll have to find somewhere else to put the books. I'm hoist by my own guitar in here. Uh, then the next two paperbacks are Signet Classics. These old Signet Classics that I've been kind of, sort of, fondly collecting when I find them, especially if I find them dirt cheap. Uh, the first one is Northanger Abbey uh, by Jane Austen with that. That's the, the colophon that I'm looking for. The second one is going to throw off my little collection of these signet classics because it doesn't have a white spine like all the rest of them do. It's Roxana by Daniel Defoe. I haven't seen this one in ages, so I grabbed it, but it's it's got a colored spine. Uh, but... Every once in a while, when I see these things, I grab them, and they always tempt me to pull them down and reread them, even though these things are prime fodder for existing in ebook. All of Daniel Defoe exists in ebook. All of Jane Austen exists. You can get them all from Project Gutenberg in beautifully curated editions that cost you nothing at all and that you can read on your reading device. Uh, it's not always a foldable book. It's not always a mass market paperback that you have to worry about. I have to worry about whether or not this is going to rip or tear. I have to worry about whether or not it snaps closed if I don't have a bookmark in it. I have to hunt around for my spot. Uh, I have to worry if, I, if a character mentions visiting Epsom on page 250. I sit there thinking, wait, but somebody totally different mentioned Epsom earlier in this novel in a completely different context. Where was it? And I'm doing this for the next hour until I lose interest or until I find it and it all feels anticlimactic. When, with the e-copy, I can just ask the e-copy where and exactly in what context does the word Epsom appear in this book. Uh, but even so, mass market paperbacks have a, a place in my heart. Uh, and those are the only mass market paperbacks. Then we'll do uh, trade paperbacks and hardcovers. The first trade paperback is an author that we were just talking about yesterday. Uh, uh, but it's a book of his that I've never read. This is from Scholastic. It's going to make all of you go misty-eyed with nostalgia. It's Gordon Dixon. Uh, but it's a, it's a kid's book called Secret Under the Sea. I believe that is supposed to be a dolphin, not a shark. I think. Uh, let, let's see. Why is his dolphin acting so... Yeah, that's supposed to be a dolphin. Uh, acting so strangely. Something must be wrong. It is the year 12, 2013. Ancient history. Uh, but far in the future when this book was written. And Robbie lives in an underwater research station with his scientist parents. Most of the time, he has fun exploring the ocean caves with the dolphin, who is his favorite companion. But something has frightened the dolphin, and Robbie sets out to investigate. Then he finds the giant footprints, and he knows that something enormous and unknown is walking across the bottom of the sea. <laughs> I have no idea if uh, Gordon Dixon is any good at scaling down his pretensions to write for uh, kids. I'd never heard of this before, so happily, happily give it a try. It'd take me 15 minutes. 
Uh, then this next one is something that I have read many, many times. It was basically free. I think these paperbacks were 50 cents. Uh, so I grabbed it because I don't have a copy. This is a placeholder, I admit. What I really want is a hardcover with a dust jacket. The Brattle will provide. I will certainly see it. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It's Dan Simmons who wrote the Hyperion Cantos that I really, really like. But I like some of his big, ambitious later novels even more. And this is the one that really opened my eyes. This is the terror. Uh, this is the one that really opened my eyes to what this author could do. I loved this book. Just loved it. On one level, it's about the doomed Franklin expedition, where two ships, the Terror and the Erebus, went out to try and map the most inhospitable reaches of the Northwest Passage and got trapped in the ice. And the men were trapped. And that's a horrific enough story on its own. The actual uh, outlines of that horrific story are detailed in a bravura opening chapter in this book. A whole bunch of old seasoned explorers are talking about the expedition that this guy is thinking about undertaking and all the horrible ideas about it, how, how bad it could go. Uh, of course, it goes much worse. This is, this is uh, intelligently done horror uh, in a way that I don't often see. I, I got this ratty trade paperback just, just to, uh, to bring it home. Uh, and maybe I'll be tempted to reread it, but what I really want is either an ebook or the hardcover with a dust jacket, or both. Uh, then this next one, well, I don't know if... Uh, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> I just noticed this. Oh, you're going to love this. This is Eamon Duffy, the great Irish historian, and this is his masterpiece, The Stripping of the Altars, Traditional Religion in England from 1400 to 1580. And the reason I laughed is because it still has somebody's brattle sticker on it. <laughs> I got this elsewhere. Somebody got this at the Brattle and obviously decided it's too much for them, so they they dumped it at this Goodwill. I'll have to take that Brattle sticker off. This is a magnificent work. It's brilliant to read, as you would expect from anyone who's Irish, writing any kind of writing, uh, who isn't James Joyce. Uh, but it's 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 provocative, too. It's, uh, it's meant to be argument-starting and maybe argument-settling. As you can tell from the dates... On the subtitle there, this deals with Catholicism in England before it was wrecked and supplanted by the Protestant Reformation, by uh, the Tudors. And what Duffy pro proclaims right from the beginning of this book and all throughout is that Catholicism, contrary to what historians have been saying forever and ever, was not dying in England. It was a vibrant, healthy, and beloved religion when the Tudors started going at it with hammer and pitons when the Tudors started literally stripping the altars. The title is uh, kind of a night, por a night fork. It, it looks in two different directions. The stripping of the altars is also part of the Catholic liturgy. But in this case, it means literally uh, Henry VIII Cromwell's agents going into churches and monasteries and whatnot and stripping the altars of all their gold, tearing apart the coppices, of, uh, tearing apart the jeweled robes, taking the gold and melting it down, uh, tearing apart the graven images, all that sort of thing, that left, it was a traumatic thing to happen to England's ca Catholics. The, the idea in a lot of uh, standard histories about the subject is that nobody really liked Catholicism, nobody really believed in it, that the country was ripe for change. That isn't true. And Duffy does a great job. This is a classic work of English history. Uh, that was clearly too too classic for somebody who got it at the battle. Uh, again, this is another one. This is from Yale University Press. This is another one. Ideally, I would like to find a hardcover with a dust jacket. I don't think I'm ever going to do that. A hardcover of the Terror will be fairly easy to come across. But this thing, I don't think I've ever seen since it first came out when I got rid of my hardcover. I don't think I've ever seen it in a hardcover with a dust jacket in any kind of shape. And it's a classic work of history, so I, I really do want one. But I'll take the trade paperback, not necessarily as a placeholder. I'll gladly keep it until it falls apart. Uh, then the these next one is epic fantasy. Not a thing you usually see on this channel, although, like everybody else, I have a sweet, a sweet tooth for epic fantasy. Uh, something about the elaborate world-building and stuffing it with characters and history and articulated magic systems. Uh, Brian at Bookish did a video just this morning uh, uh, that was kind of intriguing about how it was his, it was his early love for epic fantasies and their world-building, their consistent... Uh, continuity-minded world-building that set him up to like later non-fantasy authors who do that kind of thing. He mentioned uh, Patrick O'Brien, the Aubrey and Matron novels. I'd never even thought, that, but that's absolutely true, that that is world-building. That is exactly, you. if your muscles have been built by Narnia, 
or the Belgariad or anything like that, you're going to be in fine shape to encounter an articulated multi-volume worldview. He also mentions Balzac, of course, his favorite Balzac, who did the same thing, uh, who decided to, to join a lot of his novels together into one huge tapestry of a semi-contiguous uh, word. Uh, I guess maybe that I saw that video and maybe that whetted my appetite. Plus, I didn't want Vin to call me a wicked pissa loser. Uh, so I grabbed an epic fantasy. It's the first volume in The Blood Sworn by John Gwynn. This is gorgeous cover. Just, the only thing, the only problem I have with this cover is that the cover artist, I'm going to bash them, I should say who they are, Ma Marcus Winnie. The only problem I have with this cover is that the cover artist abandoned his imagination, his job as a cover artist, is to have an imagination. He abandoned it in order to give us smog from the Hobbit movies. Uh, he, had, he had the whole world to choose from in, in imagining a dragon, and instead he gave us one that's indistinguishable from both smog in the Hobbit movies and the dragons in Game of Thrones on HBO. When there's no reason for it. Your dragon could be just as frightening, just intimidating, and not be any of that. But this is, I was encouraged because this is the first volume in a fantasy series, so I won't, I won't be caught out. Uh, Let's see here. From master storyteller John Gwynn comes a Norse-inspired epic of blood and vengeance. When the gods fought, it was a battle so savage they destroyed themselves, leaving nothing but their bones and a broken land of Vigrid in their wake. I wonder if that actually refers to the myth of Ragnarok. In Norse mythology, the thing that a lot of people forget when they just hip-check Ragnarok is that Ragnarok did have survivors, both divine and human. Uh, people did survive, just the old order didn't survive. Uh, now, as whispers of war echo over the fjords and across the plains, fate follows in the footsteps of three warriors, a huntress on a perilous quest, a noblewoman pursuing battle fame, and a thrall seeking retribution among the mercenaries known as the Blood Sworn. All three will change the course of the world as it once more falls under the shadow of the gods. Sounds delightful. <laughs> and uh, Brian mentions in his video that if you're going to have an epic fantasy, you have to have a map. So, uh, yes, we do. We do have a map. There is Vigrid, <laughs> with looks like one serpentine mountain range just splitting the whole of the thing in half. Uh, interesting. So I got I I might have seen this thing. I might even have dipped into it when I was when I was reading fantasy more regularly. Uh, one thing that I that you've noticed if you've watched this channel for a while is that science fiction and fantasy authors don't tend to send me everything. Uh, nobody sends me anything anymore in the post pandemic days. But once upon a time, even when I was getting twenty books a day. Uh, they usually weren't epic fantasy or science fiction. More's the pity, but understandably, I didn't. I don't review much of it. So, uh, but I figured once I had this and once I had plopped on it, I don't know what I'll do if I like it. I guess there are other volumes out there. I'll just have to find. Uh, but once I once I was done uh, putting this in my in the crook of my elbow, I thought, well, the best possible rejoinder to a long fantasy novel would be. A fantasy novel twice as long, so I got that as well. This is Legacy of Ash by Matthew Ward. Look at the size of this thing. Utterly gigantic. This is uh, the Legacy Trilogy, Volume 1. They, interesting, they both do that. They both do, they note what they are on the spine. Uh, that's interesting. So this, well, let's see what this is. Uh, a shadow has fallen over the Tressian Republic, but as Tressia falls, heroes rise. Uh, Victor Arca Arcadra is the Republic's champion, a warrior without equal. He also hides a secret that would see him burned as a heretic. Josiri Trellin is Victor's sworn enemy, a political prisoner. He dreams of reigniting his mother's failed rebellion. And Kayleen Trellin, Jory Josiri's sister, seeks only to break free of their tarnished legacy to escape the expectations and prejudice that haunt the family name. As war spreads across the Republic, they must set aside their differences in order to save their homeland. However, decades of bad blood are not easily forgotten, and victory will demand a darker price than any of them could have imagined. Notice the element that's missing from that. <laughs> if you think I'm going to slog through, what is this? Uh, 800 pages of epic fantasy without any fantasy? <laughs> without any fantasy elements? No magic creatures? Oh, just mentioned crap. <laughs> without any magic creatures or anything like that? you got another thing coming. So any of you read these things, either Shadow of the Gods or... Uh, Legacy of Ash. Let me know what I'm in for. Uh, but we're not done. Not nearly. <laughs> we have plenty more to go, uh, despite all the bean antics. The, this next one is from Granta. Great, huge thing that I grabbed because 
Uh, well, because October is kind of a last hurrah of reading fiction before I devote most of my time to nonfiction for nonfiction November. This is something a lot of you will have already seen. I sold it in my bookstore uh, and never really thought about having a copy for my own because of the editor. Now I'll give it a try. This is the, grant, the new Granted Book of the American Short Story. They did one years before this. And it is edited by Richard Ford. It's this enormous thing. And uh, I naturally, as you would expect, I'm not a big fan of Richard Ford or any dude brolet. I, I'm not a big fan of, you know, the fly fishing and the bowling, and I never really meant to write, and I don't really care about the fripperies of beautiful or inventive language. I'm just trying to tell a story that I've sort of worked out on a yellow legal pad on this red checkered tablecloth in between uh, re-gearing the crankcase on my car out in the garage because I'm figuring she's going to be ready someday. I, etc 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 but i saw this thing and it was 50 cents and i thought well okay so richard ford is a dude bro author but he might be a good editor <laughs> he might he might pick really good authors uh so and this has a lot of authors in here just a huge number of them so he obviously i mean it's a big book but he obviously goes for uh stories that aren't all that long uh, so and i don't think i ever even dipped into this when it first came out Okay, the bean has gone back on her perch, so I can put these here until she wants to jump down again. Uh, then this next one, uh, I have never seen before. It's a Sherlock Holmes anthology, a hardcover, but I grabbed it. It was dirt cheap. I think this was 50 cents. I think this was discounted. This is uh, 33 by Arthur Conan Doyle, edited by John Michael Gibson and Richard Lancelin Green. Uh, Richard Lancelin Green, I assume, is the son of Roger Lancelin Green. Uh, I'm not going to get a biography of him in this thing, but this this is the thing that it is. 33 by Arthur Conan Doyle. I've seen, I thought, every Arthur Conan Doyle book in the world. I've never seen this. And I'm assuming that this is 33 Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, but now that I'm holding my hand, I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not just Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh... The publishing history of the stories of Conan Doyle presents a problem in literary detection that would have challenged his own most famous creation, Sherlock Holmes. His first published story appeared anonymously. Later stories have been misattributed, pirated, suppressed, or simply lost, while others appeared in ephemeral publications now quite inaccessible to the general reader. This volume brings together 33 of Doyle's lesser-known stories, 10 of them never previously identified as the work of Doyle. How fascinating. Here is the work of over half a century, from his first story to achieve print, uh, to the posthumous The Last Resource that came out in 1930. The range of backgrounds and styles is immense. Here are tales of prospecting, the stage, regimental mess, the recollections of the driver of a London growler, vignettes of historical research, tales of mystery, excursions into erudite farce, and a story of black prediction that postulates an alternative ending to World War I. Okay, but I thought I saw a Sherlock Holmes story. Did I not see any? Are there no Sherlock Holmes stories in here? Hang on just a second. Well, I've, I want to see. Did I get a, a... That would significantly increase the interest in this book for me if there are no Sherlock... Yeah, no, there are none. Son of a gun. Okay, well, I didn't know that. Fantastic. This is not... This is Arthur Conan Doyle writing short stories that are not Sherlock Holmes. Incredible. Okay, fantastic. I'm very glad I have it then, and it goes close to the top of the list. Uh, then these next two probably are the things that constitute the real finds of the day. I don't know if you have finds at the Goodwill. <laughs> I don't know one way or another. Maybe it's a toaster that works. I saw a woman at one of these Goodwills go up to one of the, the staff. Maybe this is why the staff was so rude. A woman went up to one of the staff. She couldn't have been more than three feet tall. A, a kerchief, big iron boots, straight, straight out of the old country. And she walked up to him and said, how much is this? She was holding a single shoe. And, and the, the, the kid who she asked said, that was in a sorting bin. And she said, yeah, how much? And the kid said, well, it's in the sorting bin because there is no pair to it. It's just a single shoe. It is literally worthless. <laughs> you couldn't wear it. She still wanted to know. He still had to go and find somebody to tell price. <laughs> but anyway, if you can have finds at the Goodwill, and I think these next two uh, probably count, because they're two Gore Vidal collections that I didn't have in hardcover. The first is Matters of Fact and Fiction, Essays from 1973 to 1976. There is our author. And this will have all sorts of political stuff that would get winnowed from the gigantic United States mega collection. But I'm sure it'll also have literary stuff. Yeah, matters of fiction. The top ten bestsellers, Louis Auchincloss, Calvino, Nabokov. 
Uh, and then matters of fact, a lot of those will also get uh, winnowed out of the big United States one volume. That's the thing. That's why I want all these earlier collections, because they'll have stuff that didn't make the cut. I want them all. <laughs> so I've, I've matters of fact and fiction. And I also found uh, at home essays 1982 to 1988. So I'm missing this goes from 73 to 76. This goes from 82 to 88. So I'm missing one in between. I may have it already. Uh, this is uh, at home. Let's see. Does this also split uh, political and literary? Uh, at Home in Washington, D.C., an essay on flying, Tennessee Williams, Richard Nixon, Hollywood, uh, Ron and Nancy Reagan, uh, The Day the American Empire Ran Out of Gas, The National Security State. Oh, but then part two is all literary. The Book Chat of Henry James, William Dean Howells, The Golden Bowl, Logan Pearsall Smith, good Lord, Oscar Wilde, again with Calvino, uh, an uh, essay called Why I Am Eight Years Younger Than Anthony Burgess. I've read that. That's, I think, in the United States. I loved it. And also his his uh, extremely noted piece on Don Powell, the novelist Don Powell, where he sings her praises and, and shames the whole literary world for ignoring her. And that sparked a renaissance in Don Powell that lasted for 20 years. So I think these are probably the, uh, the finds of the day. These things are... Uh, they're, they're right at the top of the list for uh, for rereads, and I know that I will be visiting them forever and ever. These things are definitely keepers, whereas a lot of these things I was tempted by the price, so they might not be. Stripping of the Altars I would like in a more durable form. The Terror I would like in a more durable form. I really doubt I'm going to keep Gordon Dixon's children's book for Scholastic Press. It would be interesting to read, but I really doubt I'll keep it. I doubt I'll keep the epic fantasies, unless they blow me away. Uh, and then there's this last thing, which uh, when we're talking about keeping something... <sighs> You would think that this book would be an object lesson for me never to get rid of any books again, ever. And yet I am constantly talking about winnowing my collection in Project Harrigan. <laughs> and the reason why I even noticed this thing is because I just saw it on a, a book haul by Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads. He got a copy of this for a, a nickel and a jar of maple syrup or whatever he paid for it up in Vermont and held it up on his channel. I believe it was Mark's channel. And uh, my first reaction was, what an incredible book that was. Boy, oh boy. And when the video was over, and I, the next time I got up, the next time I heaved myself to my feet, I thought, you know, I should pull down my copy of that book uh, and just check my marginalia, check the notes, put, see whatever I did with it, maybe, maybe even schedule it for a reread. Looked around, to my horror, realized I didn't have it. I got the advanced copy. I think I showed the advanced copy on this channel. I got the finished copy. I'm pretty sure I talked about the finished copy on this channel. Gone. My finished copy was gone. No idea where. No idea why I would ever get rid of it. I had lovingly tipped in tons and tons of reviews. I just automatically assumed that I had it. I, I can't imagine that I don't, but I don't. Uh, so when I saw it today, I grabbed it. It's this thing. It's, it's Peter Parker's Houseman Country, which is a weird and wonderful book. I wish that I still had all the, the pieces that I tipped into it, uh, but I'll take it as it is. It's a, I mean, it, it, in its bones, it's, an, it's a biography of A.E. Houseman. Uh, but it expands from there to Houseman's old world. What would lead him to idealize the Shropshire countryside that he only barely ever visited? And why did that idealization of that rural England take off so much with the public our imagination? Now, I think the answer to that isn't as mystical as Peter Parker likes to go into. He goes at it at great length in this book, and he's wonderful to read. But if you print... Uh, a Shropshire Lad is it's a beguiling and memorable little poetry collection, but the emphasis is on little. It's a tiny little thing. If you're the home office and you print a million copies of that and put it one in the rucksack of every single British soldier going off to the Expeditionary Force in World War I, if you flood the markets with penny copies of it back home, well, World War I is already poised to make a whole nation get all wistful about a golden age that is now ending, even if it didn't ever exist. <laughs> They're already poised to love a thing like that. Houseman just came along at the exact right time. I think that might be all that's necessary to explain the incredible allure of that book. But this book goes on from there even further to not only a Shropshire Lad, but the, all of the poetry of the time. It, it's just amazing. It, I love the way it expands in concentric circles from what prior, probably was its original sort of uh, pitch, 
or Parker's original idea on written paper when he worked it out, hopefully not at a red check or tablecloth. It, it eventually just expands and expands, and you're all along for the ride because it's so enjoyable. I wanted it to just keep going. I do not know why I got rid of my copy of this book unless I sent it to one of you. That's the only thing I can think of, the only conceivable reason why I would get rid of a book I really liked. Would I think this even ranked highly on the year-end list, on the Steve Reed's year-end list that is slowly trundling towards us as we speak. The only year-end list that means anything. I think it actually featured prominently on that list. I'll have to check and see. Uh, I can't imagine, unless one of you said, I really want that and I live in a book desert, I won't ever see it on my own, you know, playing on the heartstrings. If one of you did that, that might be the reason why. But I'm glad I have it again. <laughs> I guess I was, and it was dirt cheap. So, uh, so there you go. That was my uh, Goodwill book haul. A command performance. <laughs> my captain, Vin, at Revenant Reads, insisted that I do this. So I went and did it. I don't know that I'll be darkening the doorsteps of those Goodwills anytime soon. I, the, I, I know it's going to sound very spoiled of me, but I, I, my one defense of myself is that I worked in customer service for a long time. If you work in retail, you work in customer service. If you think that's not true, get out of retail. Uh, and I put a high premium on making sure that my customers were not only welcome, but that they enjoyed themselves while they were in the store. And so it might sound a little peevish on my part, but I really, it really is the kiss of death if I get bad customer service at a store. If it's a store that I can at all avoid after that, I probably will. I know it doesn't mean anything to the store's bottom line, but I, I, I just don't like to put myself in the way of that kind of treatment. Uh, we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. The need for clothing occasionally does crop up, even for someone who never leaves his phantom couch. Uh, but in the meantime... We'll do a steep pyramid here for my Goodwill Command Performance. We have, uh, oh, look at that. Oh, Mark was right. You know, I agree with him when he expresses his irritation. Why do, why do charity shops do this? Why do they put perfunctory stickers on these things when they could just have a chart at the registers? If it's a hardcover, it's X amount of money. If it's a paperback, it's Y amount of money. Why do you need stickers on literally everything? Probably they're all covered in stickers now. I just didn't notice. But anyway, we have Houseman Country. We have uh, Matters of Fact and Film. Oh, God, they're all got stickers on them. Uh, then uh, At Home, two essay collections by Gore Vidal. We have 33 by Arthur Conan Doyle. A collection of Doyle stories that are not Sherlock Holmes stories. Amazing. Amazing. Then we have two epic fantasy uh, Megillas, Legacy of Ash and The Shadow of the Gods. I'd love to hear from you epic fantasy fans if you've read either one of these things. Does either one of them noticeably better than the other? Uh, then the Granta Book of American Short Stories. Oh, God. All the rest of these are on the other side. Oh, God. Uh, the Stripping of the Altars by Eamon Duffy. Uh, here, can we can we get these over here so that we're not... Uh, okay, then The Terror uh, by Dan Simmons. I don't I don't think I'll be keeping this copy, but I, it's it's good. It was good to have, anyway. Uh, Secret Under the Sea by Gordon Dixon, A Boy Finds Mysterious Monster Prints at the Bottom of the Ocean. Uh, and then a bunch of mass markets. We have Northanger Abbey. Uh, I won't be able to see it. It's not a real pyramid if you can't see it. Uh, Roxana by Daniel Defoe. Not one of his better-known books, but I really enjoy it. Uh, the Burton Raffle Beowulf, uh, which you Beowulf purists out there will say is a travesty, uh, but I think it does some interesting things. And finally, The Moving Toy Shop by Edmund Crispin. Uh, in this Penguin Crime thing. <laughs> there you go. Oh my god. <laughs> there you go. It's, it won't even fit in the camera. Uh, so th I'm not saying that it was an unsuccessful uh, Goodwill trip. There's a lot of books, and I think there are some keepers in this batch. I will peel all those stickers off and clean these things up. I notice some of them are a little bit on the scuffy side. Uh, and I suppose when it's time for me, once I've inventoried them and I've looked through them and I've annotated them and whatnot, put my mark on them, I suppose then I will do another perfunctory search for my original copy of Houseman Country. My eyes are scanning the shelves right now, and I know that I don't have it, but I can't believe I would get rid of it. So I'll probably look for it one more time before I put this thing away in the biography section. But anyway, that was my Goodwill haul, so I hope this alleviates the social pressure mockery and TikTok derision that I'm getting from Vin. <laughs> but, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll see you soon. Thank you, Book Two.